This is the Ted Wallachian Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. And now, here's Ted. My special guest this week is currently the crime analyst for CP24 Television in Toronto. Prior to this, he served with the Toronto Police Services as a sex crime and a homicide detective, during which he was involved in more than 150 investigations. He is also the author of the bestseller, The Ghosts That Haunt Me, Memories of a Homicide Detective. Welcome, Steve Ryan. Thank you, Ted. I, I quite enjoyed the book. Uh, as I mentioned, it's called The Ghosts That Haunt Me. It's now going to haunt me for the next little while. Uh, boy, oh boy, it's, uh, it's, it's a great read, but I'll, but I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's not an easy read. It's a tough read. It, you know, it's a tough read, but it, it was the most honest I think I've ever been with myself when it came to how the job affected me. Yeah, yeah. So you, you grew up as a, as a young kid. You weren't really uh, thinking of becoming a cop at a, at a young age, like, like a lot of kids do, because they, they, from what they see on television, they think, well, this is really exciting. But one evening, while your dad is watching the news, of course, you have no interest in the news because you're a young kid, comes a story about a young boy that we all got to know, this, this horrific story of a young boy named Emmanuel Jacques. A shoeshine boy who was found dead in downtown Toronto, and this hit you profoundly, to the point where you thought to yourself, "Quote: He was just like me." And you decided at that point you were determined to do something to stop things like this from happening in the future. Yeah, that's right. You know, I saw the reaction not only about from my my parents, but also the community. Just how affected. We all were, and he was my age, so how affected we all were by his brutal death, and I thought, you know, I could, I could do this. I could find people who do this to people. And so we, when, when did it dawn on you, to, at a, in a serious level, that I'm going to pursue this, and this is what I need to do in order to pursue this? So when I was in high school, we had a career day, and it was something that was always in the back of my head that I wanted to do, and then when I, I spoke to the officer that came to the career day, it was... Um, of great interest to me. And oddly enough, though, my goal was to not spend a lot of time in uniform. I wanted to be a homicide detective from the day I, I thought I wanted to do the job. And uh, that's eventually what I worked towards. But you started as in, doing, in sex crimes, correct? Yeah. So I started in uniform. I was a cadet. So at 18 years yeah, old, right. at, eight, at 18 years old, uh, we, it was an apprenticeship and we wrote shotgun and police cards. We were trained on the Harley Davidsons. We did all the uh, parking tags. We keep the rush hours clear. And all the while we're learning about police work. And then the police service is monitoring you as well, because when you turn 21 and then they shipped you off to Elmer, which is just outside of London. And that's the police college where every officer in the, in the uh, province has to go. Mm -hmm. You came back and you did one another horrific crime you, you you have six different stories in the book we, we won't have a chance to go through all of them but i've picked out a couple of them that i found are important for a number of different reasons uh the first one deals with with a young girl named uh, holly jones and at this point you are in sex crimes but this yeah. was the story that propelled you from sex crimes to want to become part of the homicide division I, that's right. And again, it was a case. I was a young detective and I worked for some experienced detective sergeants in homicide and in sex crimes. And it was one of those cases where everybody could remember where they were when this happened. And mm. it was really an eye opener to me um, how a homicide investigation is, is, is uh, performed. Now, let's, just as a bit of a refresher for our listeners, let's go back. What year would this have been? It would have been 2002, I believe, ish in and around there. In the west end of Toronto, in the, in the junction area. It was in the junction, and a young girl was uh, walking. She was 10 years old. Holly Jones was walking her uh, young girlfriend home for the very first time when she was abducted. And her parents, of course, panicked, as most parents would, thinking, well, what, what, what happened here? As the afternoon grew later and later into the evening, and then eventually she called the police. And at that point, when are you brought in? So I was brought in once it was confirmed that it was a stranger on stranger abductions. Statistically, when a child is abducted, it's normally a parent or a family member that does that. 
Right. But in this case, it was confirmed that, in fact, she was abducted. Right. So at that point, they say, okay, we've got to bring in sex crimes. Uh, and how long before they realized that, that, in fact, that she had been murdered? I'm going to say within the first 12 hours, her uh, remains started to show up in different parts of the city. And that's when we knew it was a confirmed homicide. And at that point, then homicide begins to work hand in hand with, uh, with, with sex crimes, correct? Yeah, that's right. So I would work with, uh, funny enough, I worked with um, Mark Saunders, who it was a detective with me at the time. He was in homicide. He then became chief, as we all know. Mm -hmm. And we would be assigned different details. Uh, as tips would come in, it was our job to track them down. Right. Now, who takes the lead in, in, this, in this situation? Would it be the homicide detectives? Homicide and sex crime. So it was detective sergeant from both units. They are the ones that would go through all of the tips, prioritize them, and then send them out to, to they all had to be cleared regardless of how silly they may have sounded every tip that we received had to be cleared okay so now in the in the, in the case of this little girl uh her body was found how many days after she was reported missing the, within 24 hours within 24 hours right it okay. started to surface her body parts started to surface but they surfaced not in the area where she went missing that's right uh, part of her for remains surfaced uh, in, in Lake Ontario by the big uh, windmill there in by Ontario Place, and then other parts washed up on the center island, I think a day or two later. And, it, and both were in bags. Obviously, he tried to, uh, Michael Breer was his name, he tried to um, hide them by putting them in bags and thinking they were going to sink to the bottom of the lake, and, and clearly they didn't. And you think to yourself, okay, so um, how do you begin to try to trace something like this down? Well, you rely on the community to, to provide tips, and we had thousands of tips that we were working on, and it is literally like looking for a needle in a haystack because we had no suspects. We just had body parts of a child. Thankfully, there was DNA on her, was under her fingernails. She was scratching at him as he was assaulting her, so we had a piece of evidence to work with after that. So you had some evidence, including uh, some carpet fibers as well? There was carpet, green carpet fibers found on her. There was weights in the bag, and we had the, the DNA. So the DNA was the priority, and there was a controversial decision made by Chief Fantino at the time and the two leading detective sergeants with the consultation from a crown that we were going to, I think it was a six-block radius, we were going to get DNA, consensual DNA, from every man that lived within that area. I remember that story, and, and obviously not everybody, and I don't understand why somebody, if somebody came to me and said, I want your DNA because we're looking for somebody who may have murdered a young girl, I'd be more than happy knowing that I'm innocent. And clearly there were a lot of people who said no, and obviously they were not all guilty. One was, but not the rest of them weren't. Why would somebody, what would compel somebody not to give their DNA? Well, a couple of reasons that we were told. Number one, they didn't trust the system. Or you've committed your own offenses, bank robberies, uh, break and enters, and you're concerned that you may have left blood or some other traceable evidence at the scene. But okay. we were quite clear that we were only collecting the DNA to be compared to what was found on Holly's remains, period. That was it. But when people refused, men refused, we had to clear them some other way. We couldn't just say person A, B, and C said no, and we moved on. We had to clear them somehow. So is that at that point, is that, is that when you go and you, and you talk to your, your colleagues in surveillance and say, okay, we've got five, six people that were concerned, maybe uh, guilty in this crime, follow them, see if you can pick up any evidence, any kind of DNA samples? Well, what we did initially was we had a, a briefing with all the officers that were going to collect the DNA. And what they were told were, was, use your senses, smell, eyes, look beyond the person because you can't get into the house unless they invite you and it's not really necessary to get into the house so when Breer refused when Michael Breer refused the officers could see green carpet they could smell like an ammonia or a bleach that was used to clean up uh, the mess that was left and they could see uh, weights in the back behind him and they mm. were all things that the officers were told to look for as they were going door to door asking for consent DNA samples. Right. And unlike um, television, we watch the television programs, the DNA results come back in an hour. It, this takes days and days, does it not? It does. It does for sure. So when Breer DNA uh, was refused, the surveillance was put on him and it took a few days of, of surveilling him, not only in vehicle, but on foot or wherever he went. We had surveillance officers on him 
around the clock. And the idea then was to get a discard sample. So the law says that anything that's thrown out and it's thrown in public, you as an officer can seize that. And that's what the surveillance officers did. And they followed him and, and he inadvertently gave himself up via a can of soda pop. That's right. Oddly enough, he went into the local variety store, picked himself up a can of uh, soda, and then he discarded that can into the garbage. So the surveillance officers that were on foot were able to go to that garbage right away and get whatever was in there. Wow. So at this point, you decide, I think I would rather be in homicide rather than sex crimes. Well, sex crimes is uh, just as gruesome. And I would say this about that. You've got living victims. And when you've got a victim in a sex crime saying to you, I wish he killed me, I mean, that certainly strikes a chord uh, with an investigator because that crime itself is so vile and it ruins people for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I, I would imagine that it does. You, you write that in, in your book, you said that Steve Ryan is my, is my guest, by the way. He is the author of The Ghosts That Haunt Me, Memories of a Homicide Detective. It, it's a fascinating read. You write in your book, Homicide Sticks to Your Skin. It follows you home when you arrive back work from work late at night. It hangs in the air like a dark cloud traveling with you wherever you go. You can't wash it away. You can't sleep it off. can never erase it from your memory. There's no way to escape it, not even if you try to. It's always there. Once you are a homicide detective, you're always known as a homicide detective because the things that your eyes see and your brain processes and your nose smells, you could never get past that and you can never forget the, the victims that uh, that you were investigating and as you point out in in, in the chapter on, on the death of uh, holly jones and the murder of holly jones that even to this day you can't go back to center island there's a lot of landmarks that i can no longer visit and as a child i spent many many months at center island with my mom and dad and it's a place that i cannot go back to after we were over there because that is where some of her body parts were located and it was my job to go over there and then interview the guy that found them. And you go on to say in your book, you say that even prior to joining uh, Bell Media with with CP24, you said, I'll always be a detective. Even when you've joined it, you'll always be a homicide detective. And part of this permanent identity as an investigator is because of them, them being the victims whose deaths I've had the privilege of investigating. It's interesting that you would would choose the word privilege, which is really a a kind sentiment to the deceased. It is because, you know, and I say in the book, there is no greater honor than to be given the responsibility of investigating the death of another person. And families rely on you to find answers as to what happened to their loved one. And there's to this day, I still have contact with a lot of uh, family members. Moms, for instance, will call me and say, you know, it was Bob's birth, Bobby's birthday, Jimmy would have been, uh, his kid would have been five years old today. He would have been graduating from college or university. So it sticks with you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess, I guess it does. And conversely, when, have you run into anybody that you've, that you've put into jail who's, who's now come free? <laughs> Funny you should say that. Yes, I have twice. Uh, once I was at the uh, uh, Rogers Center with my son and we were ordering hot dogs and the guy <laughs> that was making the hot dog came up to me and said, uh, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, oh, I remember you. And we canceled the hot dogs. And, you know, that just kind of ruined the day for sure. But that was the first time. And then I was at uh, Young and Dundas one day, and I got a tap on my shoulder. And there was another guy that I put away for about 12 years for a manslaughter. Wow. And did they threaten you in any way? No, they were very cordial to me because like, I was a, an interrogator as well. So I took statements from them, and they got that I was respectful to them. So... It was part of the gigs up. They realized that, and they were—I wouldn't say courteous, but they were polite enough for you know for a convicted a homicide, a murderer. Yeah. So you get to know that you're, you 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 get to know who these people are during the course of the investigation, during the course of the trial, and as you said, in a couple of situations, you had actually met them as well. And but you also read in your book, you say, I often wish that I'd known the victims in their lives before the shadow of sadness and mystery that eclipsed their existences. Yes, because you get to learn secrets of a deceased that a lot of people don't know about them because you really dig into their lives, dig into their past, and you really do get to know them, but they're dead. So Oftentimes I would wish, gosh, I wish, you know, I wish I could help you. I wish I could get to know more about you when you were alive. 
And do you hope that maybe that if you had known them when they were alive, that you might have somehow been able to protect them to save them? Yeah, that's right. And I also mentioned in the book when I was a young uniform officer, I saw my first dead body and it was a suicide that uh, I, I was radio called that I had. And that was the first time I realized yeah. that when the police get involved, it's often it's often too late that the deed's already done. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And you, and you were alone when you when you discovered that woman, which was which was a mistake on your part, because you, as you said yourself, you should have waited for a partner to go into the building. Yeah, that's right, because that's the procedure. But for some reason, I went in and I'll never forget seeing this woman. She had uh, her hair done. She had a brand new dress on high heels. Her nails were done and she just looked so peaceful. And so frightening to me because the way the moon was shining in on her. And as mm -hmm. we did the investigation, we'd learned that that day, earlier in that day, she went out and bought all that stuff, went to the hairdresser and got herself all fixed up before she decided to uh, take her own life. You've, you've, you've investigated over 150 homicides in, in your career, Steve, which is, which is an awful lot. And I would think that after a while, you would be numbed to the, uh, uh, to, to the vision of the picture of a, of, of a deceased Person. Yeah, and, and that's a fair uh, thought, but you, you never are. You never forget uh, all of them. You never forget where the homicide happened. Like I said, there are landmarks all across the city of Toronto where it brings back memories to me. You never forget the autopsies. You never get the, forget the smell of death. Yeah. And it's, it's something that just stays with you forever. Well, I would imagine that in some cases the, the vision would be so gruesome. I mean, we've all seen a dead body because most of us have been to a funeral where there's an open casket and you've seen a dead body. And, and in many cases, you, you don't, that sort of, that visual kind of comes and goes. There are some that stick in my mind for years and years only because they were poorly prepared or they just, they, it should never have been an open casket to begin with. But you see these things, you know, it could be in like half hour or minutes after it's happened or even worse days after it's occurred. Uh, you can, you, you, uh, you can't actually ever get rid of those, but can you store 150 different homicides in your mind? Yes. And that's the problem with being a homicide detective is that it becomes a struggle with, happiness it becomes a struggle with trying to see yeah. or appreciate the sunrise or you know the the beautiful ocean it's it's something that i deal with on a daily basis because what i feel like and i said this in the book as well i always felt like i was looking on the other side of the pane of glass and i'd always compare everything to what those victims of a homicide went through and i just found a ha hard time you know being happy myself enjoying a ball game enjoying a leaf game i yeah. just couldn't i was numb to life because of what i'd seen at hom in homicide well, I, I think if I was trying to make myself happy, I don't know if I'd be going to a Leaf game. <laughs> but, but I digress. Ted Wallison returns in a moment. Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with a loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this, but ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable, and those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 309-0387, that's 1-866-309-0387, or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca, that's info at etpcanada.ca. Hey, if you're looking to restock your wardrobe, maybe you should consider my friend Tom Mahalik at Tom's Place. He is the inflation fighter, and right now they've got incredible deals like lips and shirts. I love these shirts. Regularly up to $225, now only $66. Designer suits are regularly up to $599, now between $179 and $279. And if you're looking for a nice sports jacket, valued at up to $695, well, they're 50% off. Tom Spice and Kensington Market. They're located at 190 Baldwin. Check them out. They are the inflation fighters. Now back to Ted Wallachan. Steve Ryan is my guest, uh, former homicide detective. He, of course, is a, is a crime analyst with CP24 and the author of The Ghosts That Haunt Me, Memories of a Homicide Detective. 
let's 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 go back now to um, your the early part of your career when when you finally did become a homicide detective. At any point, or not at any point. Here's what I wanted to say: is at what point did you first seek counseling? Because I'm ima- imagining at one point or another you must have gone and sought some sort of counseling. You know, I didn't until I I left the job. Now we had an opportunity to do so, and I was a boss in charge of a bunch of detectives. I made sure that they went. But, you know, you think to yourself, I'm okay. I got this. But in reality, Um, you don't. I would imagine you couldn't. I mean, no matter how strong you are, I mean, unless you're, you know, uh, unless you have no soul, unless you have no conscience, yet you have to be affected by it. Was is it a, when you finally left? Was it a relief to not have to wake up and not have to hear, to hear the buzzer go off on your phone, telling you that there's a body that's been found? Get down to this street and that street. It was a relief to to leave the job, and you know perhaps we can talk about the case that finally did me in with regards to leaving the job. But even as my job now as a crime analyst, when I go to these scenes, yeah. I literally get these sweats because I know what those detectives are walking into. I know when the Body removal takes that body out of that scene. I know what's in the back of that car, and that's something you just never forget. Yeah, I guess I guess you would not. You also talk about how um, sometimes you think you see these people, the deceased. Yes, there are uh, many times where I do a double take because I think I catch a glimpse and I think, oh my God, that is, or that person looks like a Holly Jones. That person looks like another case that I investigated. And then I quickly realize, of course, that they are deceased, but you just... You know, as weird as it sounds, you never forget them and you never forget how they look. And quite often, I do think that uh, I've caught a glimpse of one of them. And you write that it's just my mind playing tricks on me, ensuring that I never forget. That's right. And that's how I justify it to myself. It's, it's remembering what they have gone through and just never forgetting. Never forgetting what we as humans can do to one another. That, that, that's, that's an eye-opener in and of itself. I mentioned at the outset, Steve, that, that this was a, 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 a great read, but a difficult read. And let me just quote you here in, in, in your book, in, in, in the preface of your book. Be warned of what you're about to read is incredibly heavy and will be a great weight on your soul. If you're discomforted by any of these subjects, I suggest you place this book back on the shelf and choose something more soothing instead. I wouldn't judge you for doing so. I don't think of all the years that I've interviewed authors that I've ever heard an author tell a potential reader to consider not buying their book. And that's a great point. And I recognize the gruesomeness, being respectful, of course, because my goal was to tell the stories of these victims not be salacious in the details, but they're salacious enough that if you aren't prepared to read what I wrote, it would be a tough read. Let's talk about, um, uh, as I mentioned, there's, there are six different uh, homicides that you talk about here. We'll talk about the one that, that eventually led, you, led to your retirement, but l- let's talk about um, the one back in 2016. Many people will be familiar with this. It was, it was a murder of a doctor, Dr. Elena Frick Shamji, who was married to another doctor. Many people consider them to be the perfect couple, good-looking, good, good extremely successful people, extremely happy, at least in public, and yet that was quite the opposite. That's right. So Mohammed Shamji, the husband, who's now doing life in jail, he was a neurosurgeon, and he was brilliant with, with regards to his academics. He traveled the world lecturing on neurosurgery. But behind closed doors, he was a monster. And again, homicide teaches you that you could be driving through any part of the city, biggest mansions in the world. You never know what's behind those closed doors. Yeah. Well, I think we, I think we saw that in, in, in the case of the founder of uh, Apotex, right? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. true. So in, in this story here, he seemed to be one of those people that's detached not only from the situation but sort of almost detached from the world around him like he was just like all out onto himself he, he was well, i would say a narcissist he was good at yeah. his job he was as good at his job as a neurosurgeon but he was a monster at home i mean i i don't think i put this in the book but perhaps i did he hurt her hands. I believe he cut her hand or broke her hand so she couldn't be a surgeon. Yeah. Everybody had to be quiet when he came home. And then you talk about what he did after he killed her was something I just I just couldn't fathom. And again, her body was stuffed into a bag, into, into a suitcase. 
Her body was put into a suitcase. He left his three young children at home after killing her, and he went north of the city up to Kleinberg and th just threw her in the in the Humber River, and uh, then went to work the next morning. Yeah, you you got to think that some of these people like, like they're they're overqualified for hell, like they shouldn't shouldn't even be allowed in hell. Th that's a great point. And w what surprised me was uh, the, the many people that were calling to talk radio that week saying that oh he is such a good doctor. And I, I say that he was a murderer who happened to do neurosurgery. Let's not forget that. He was a murderer before he was a doctor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Speaking with Steve Ryan, former homicide detective who now uh, you see on CP24 is a crime analyst. He's the author of The Ghosts That Haunt Me, Memories of a Homicide Detective, a bestseller too, by the way. Congratulations to you on that. I, I had a hell of a time to try to track this book down. I got to tell you, one of the last two available in the chapters in my neighborhood. Um, t tell me about the story that, that finally brought you to a breaking point. So that was the story that brought me to a breaking point. And that's because when I, I saw uh, Alana's body in a suitcase, hearing about another human being murdered and being stuffed in a suitcase, I just finished a trial where it was a cold case from 1994. And this that's in the book as well. There's a young girl, 13 years old. Uh, that was brutally murdered and tortured, and uh, her parents, her stepmother and her father, put her in a suitcase and burned her body. So that was it for me after I saw that one. You know, what, experiencing all this as as the parent of children, how does that affect you you as as a parent in terms of disciplining your kids? Because you, you, I could see the tendency would be to become overly protective because you can't trust a bloody person. That's right. And it causes you to think that everybody is a murderer, that every child is going to be murdered, including your own. So you would be protective of them going, well, my kids never slept over at anybody's house. And my daughter went to a high school dance. I was there to pick her up. I'll tell you one quick story. It, it goes back to the Stephanie uh, Rangel case where she was murdered by another high school student. My daughter, who's brilliant when it comes to academics, she decided to dye her hair red one day. And at dinner, she said to me, Somebody wrote on my locker that they wanted to hurt me because my hair is red. And I demanded that she put her hair back to a regular color, thinking that she was going to be the next victim. And she said to me, they're not going to kill me, Dad. And at that point, the, the, a light bulb came on. And I realized I'm being a little bit overly protective uh, as a result of just a, her dyeing her hair a different color. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, I have children as well. I mean, they're adults now. But you, it, there's that fine line of am I being overly protective or am I being, am I not caring enough? Yeah. You know, and God forbid, I mean, things happen to your kids and, and, and people take blame for things that happen to the children that they should not be taking blame for because sometimes stuff just happens. Stuff just happens. And that's what concerned me as a homicide detective. When you realize you, you are the next homicide victim and you have absolutely no idea that it's going to happen. Th when I was on call as a homicide detective, meaning that when the next homicide came in, it was mine, and I was having dinner or I was out playing golf that day, I would always be reminded that there's a black cloud over somebody's head, and they're about to meet their maker, and they just don't realize it. Would you do this all over again? No, I wouldn't. The job is very rewarding. Um, it's, it's a noble career, but how it's affected me um, mentally, how it's affected my ability to be happy, no, I wouldn't do it again. And what happens when you... When you witnessed the events that we witnessed uh, very recently, just uh, north of the city, with the um, with the murder of two officers in the South Simcoe Police, how does it, it get to you? It it is like you're losing your own a brother or a sister. The policing community, whether you're retired or not, is very very tight. And to watch those officers or to hear about those officers being killed the way they did, um, you lose sleep over that. You you don't eat. It just it shakes you to your core. So you never get used to any homicide. You know, we live in a, in a society where it's, it's seemingly each and every year we keep saying things are getting worse. Things are getting worse. Are things getting worse? Things are getting worse because we have more guns on the streets, and for whatever reason, the respect of human life uh, is just not there a lot of times, and that is what causes these homicides. Some of them are just spur of the moment where the court has realized that we can all lose our temper, and that's where your manslaughter charge comes in. If there's a fight and somebody falls and hits their head, but when you're talking about abductions, when you're talking about children being uh, locked in closets and stomped to the point where their la livers are lacerated and a pathologist telling you at the, at the autopsy, this only happens in high impact collisions. 
it certainly ruins your perspective on, on humanity, I would say. Do you think the police are afforded the um, respect that they deserve? Uh, by a lot, yes, but then it's the it's those that do not respect the police are the ones that cause the harm. And you realize that when an officer is killed. When I was out covering the uh, Officer Hong homicide in, in Mississauga, there were hundreds of people who came out and shed a tear for uh, his loss. But there are those that don't like the police, and they're the ones that you have to be concerned about. When you see uh, what happens uh, and what has happened in the United States where police have shot innocent people, mainly young black men. What are your thoughts? I think that uh, some of those shootings are inexcusable. And I think what happens is, and this is just my opinion, I think that some of these officers are afraid and they have a firearm on them. And that's not an excuse. I'm saying that's what happens there, whatever reason, for whatever they've been taught, how they've got their own biases, they're afraid. And if somebody sneezes, silly example, but if somebody moves or coughs, they have this jerking reaction and they take out that fireman and they shoot them. And I think it's horrible. And I think it has to do with a lot of the training uh, that the Americans do and a lot of the mindset as well. Yeah. How did you get involved in television? So after, so in homicide, I was uh, in charge of a squad and I got to know all the media people because mm-hmm. I did all the high profile cases and Cam Woolley, who I'm sure you're familiar sure. with. Sure. It was at the uh, Alana Shamji a homicide where I was up there and he was covering the story and he asked me how I was doing. And I said, uh, not good, man. Like I'm ready to go. He picked up the phone, called the boss, introduced me to the boss. The boss spoke with me and uh, she said to me, whenever you're ready, let me know. I was hired by them. Uh, I was a month and a bit later. And that's as easy as it happened. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. So what do you do to relax now? Well, I hang out with my kid, kids a lot. I play a lot of golf, and uh, I work on my uh, mental health. Relaxing is very difficult for me. Even when I'm on the golf course with my son, there always is reflections uh, from the job I left. So relaxing for me, I, I wouldn't even use that word. I, I, I go through the motions a lot of times. Yeah. It's very hard for me to relax. You get approached by a lot of people when you're out on the street covering stories because um, you're a celebrity on television. Do you get a lot of young kids walking up to you saying, um, you know, Mr. Ryan, I'd like to be a police officer. What do you think? I, I do. Um, I wouldn't say a lot, but I have been asked that question. And I do encourage them. I tell them the good parts of the job, uniform. It's a great job. But there are there's an aspect of it that takes its toll. And you can talk to, I'm no different than any other police officer. You can talk to, especially a homicide detective. It certainly does take its toll on, on your life, on your happiness, on your ability yeah. to see the good in people. But you got to feel good about what you've done. You, you have to feel good about the, the fact that you've put your, 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 your ass on the line in many cases, um, uh, physically and, um, God, obviously, emotionally, every, every day and mentally. And, and that's, that's tough. And, and there are a lot of people who do have respect. Uh, and I'm, I'm one of them for, for the police. And, I, and I, you got to feel good about that. You do, and catching these these people who commit these crimes and being able to say to a family, I mean, there's no such thing as closure. I, I don't believe in closure, but as a homicide detective, you do the next best thing, and that is to identify who's done it and assist in the prosecution and your credibility. Every time you arrest a person for homicide and you're in court, your credibility is on the line every day because you are asking a judge and a jury to believe what you are saying. And if you get a judge who doesn't believe you, that goes like wildfire in the back of judges' chambers, and you'd have a tough time testifying in front of anybody at that point. Are our courts too soft on criminals? Our judge, I think our legislation is too soft. Our judges uh, uh, have to work within the legislation. Right, of course. But, yeah, the legislation needs to be a lot tougher when it comes to, when it comes to crimes. When it comes to parole, I think having somebody conv- committed, convicted of second-degree murder and given a parole eligibility of 13, 14 years, I mean, that's considering that the person who is dead can't get parole. I just think it's a little soft, for sure. What, what what can we do about the situation regarding guns? I mean, you know, banning guns is, is is banning guns the answer to the question when when the guns that are being used in many cases aren't coming from here anyway; they're coming stateside. So let me start by saying I'm not a gun owner, and I particularly don't care for guns. But the answer to your question is um, banning guns is going to do zero. Over the 150 homicides that I did, I did none. Zero with the with the legal gun. Every gun that was used in homicides that I uh, investigated uh, came from the states, 
every one of them. Zero guns were legal in my experience with my 150 homicides. So what do we do? Uh, I, I, tougher legislation, I guess. Tougher legislation, more enforcement at the border. Give it, give the border patrol more authority than they have right now to search vehicles, search cars. I mean, it may sound like a police state, but if we want to stop these guns from coming in, we have to um, prevent them from coming in by giving more more powers. And if you are convicted of a gun crime, that's it. I think you should go away for a very long time. Once and done. Once and you go to custody. Did we not have on the books at one point that if you were convicted of a crime while in possession of a handgun or any kind of gun, that uh, meant automatic incarceration? We had legislation that said there was a certain amount of years on top of, and I, I think it was, I think it might have been two years, uh, one year, two years. It wasn't, it, it wasn't that much. It was soft. It was a lot softer than it needs to be when you think of you know what a gun can do and who's carrying them. So I think you need to have sentences are close to close to life. If you if you have a gun and you use it, let's take attempted murder for instance. Attempted murder means that you suck at killing. That's all it means. So yeah. why why get ten years at trying to kill somebody and twenty five years for actually succeeding? Yeah, I, well, I was told by a police officer years ago that. that there was a, a, a shift going on uh, amongst the, uh, those committing crimes, carrying weapons, that especially in the younger demographic, that they were switching more to carrying knives because if you were caught in um, committing a crime in possession of a knife, it didn't mean automatic uh, incarceration, whereas if it was a gun, it did. Well, if you, were, if you committed a murder with a, a knife, it would be the same as a gun. Right. But, but for other crimes, if you did a robbery with a knife instead of a gun, yes, you would get a softer sentence for sure. Right. For sure. And, and because of that, we were at one point seeing more crimes committed with knives? Well, because of that, I was seeing a lot of uh, homicides with knives, with scissors. Um, they outweighed the amount of legal guns that were being used. And I've even said this on television, we'd be better off banning scissors and knives. We'd save lives rather than banning legal guns. Yeah. You said that um, you can never erase the thoughts of all these homicides that you witnessed. Was there, and and you disagree with the term closure. It's certainly been bandied about far too often, but was it in any way cathartic at all to write this book? It was. It was the most honest I have ever been with myself when it came to uh, how homicide in, in, um, affected me with regards to the investigations and to my own mental health. It was the most honest I've ever been. It's a great read, as I mentioned. It's tough, but it, 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 and for many of us, I mean, we recall these stories because they happen in our backyard and in, in our lifetime. And uh, Steve Ryan, I want to thank you very much for, for sharing the time with me, for opening up to where you have. And uh, Congratulations on, on your on your well. First of all, thanks for your career with police services. Congratulations on the book, and congratulations on the great work you're doing with CP24. I appreciate it, Ted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve Ryan, the author of The Ghosts That Haunt Me: Memories of a Homicide Detective. The Ted Walsh and Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place for the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices. It's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. The Ted Walsh and Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.